the Civic Research Institute's Next Round podcast. I'm Romina Ichon, COO, and with me as always is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Well, Tim, we can't help but give our two cents on the New Hampshire primary. I think it's, maybe it's just me, Tim, but I actually thought that Nikki Haley made a pretty good showing at 43% versus Donald Trump at 54%. It could have been a lot worse. That said, I would have to agree with with Jeff Anderson last week on the podcast uh, that uh, Donald Trump pretty much has a nomination sewed up at this point. And polls show that that Haley won't do well in South Carolina, uh, her home state, which is kind of a surprise to me. She got elected to governor twice, so I'm surprised she's doing so poorly. So any thoughts, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. To me, it's always been a question of math. And New Hampshire, followed by South Carolina, was the play. And the way the New Hampshire primary is, it's a more open primary. There's a long history of Democrats and independents crossing over. Well, if that isn't the place where Haley would win, well, where is she going to win? Because she's done well as of late, she has the money to keep going on in South Carolina. And it seems like she's going all in in on a kind of a critical platform that's critical of Trump and wanting to change the direction and have a new day for the GOP. But it's just a question of A, are the voters going to buy that? And B, are her funders going to continue funding that? That's the other math question, of course. Now, Haley has a lot of fundraisers coming up in California and other states, so she's going to test the theory of are donors willing to continue uh, putting big money into her race. It's a real conundrum for her, and we'll just have to wait and see. Now, I know you've been looking into what really is the next contest on the calendar, which is the Nevada primary or caucus, or is it both? So explain kind of what's going on in Nevada and why we shouldn't really read too much into the results. Yeah, you know, it's it's a little weird in Nevada, Tim. So there actually is a Nevada primary and there's also a, a caucus. So the primary takes place on Tuesday, February 6th, a caucus a couple days later, Thursday, February 8th. Now, Nevada has always been a caucus state for, for decades, but because of voting irregularities, no surprise, of course, uh, they went to a primary this time. The GOP decided to stay with a caucus because they couldn't agree with the Dems on, on the uh, rules for the primary. But meantime, Haley registered for the primary, so she's the only name on the primary. And Donald Trump uh, went the other way, he went with the caucus. And the GOP decided that the, the caucus would be their official way. So all the delegates from the caucus will uh, officially go to the winner, and the winner will be Donald Trump because Haley is, is not on the on the caucus. So Trump's got that sewn up too, 26 delegates from Nevada. So that's why, you know, there isn't much juice happening in Nevada. You won't hear much about it. And uh, with, everyone's moved on to, to South Carolina. Carolina. Well, you know, it's interesting. This subject came up um, during my um, recent appearance at the Commonwealth Club, and my friend Melissa Kane is one of the panelists. She's very interested in these sorts of issues. And, you know, I think it begs the question of what Nevada is doing. In the day and age of 2024, in our high-tech information age, well, should we still be having caucuses at all? You know, should primary elections be just elections decided by voters? And you know, should the parties be running these primary contests or should the government be? Because, right, a primary election is run by uh, by the government. And so I think the Nevada one is kind of an interesting battle that you see going on between the government decided against the wishes of the party that they wanted to have a primary election rather than a caucus. But I guess the, the issue, and you may see it repeated in other states going forward, is, well, who ultimately decides who chooses a party's candidate? Is it all of the voters or is it a select group of of party activists and the most committed party members? And that's an interesting one to see. And also, you know, can the government force a party to run a primary seemingly against its wishes? So it's all a very interesting question. But as you see in 2024, in this case, it kind of gives it to one candidate. But what will it what will happen in 2028 when it's theoretically going to be a more open field? Yeah, you bring up interesting points because we're kind of small government people here you know we're at least 
I'm kind of partial to the caucus, even though I think it's a little kind of quaint and odd, but I, I like the idea of, of, of voters caucusing, but it'll be, a, it'll be interesting um, in the next uh, election, as you point out. But this, at this point, Donald Trump's got Nevada sewn up. Um, let's let's move on to our Senate race here. I wasn't able to watch the Senate debate, but I did read a bunch of uh, news stories on it. And from all accounts, it was a mixed bag for, for Steve Garvey. Some thought, uh, George Skelton specifically, that uh, since the Dems were ga- ganging up on, the, on Steve Garvey, that it'll bring out Republicans. Others thought that Garvey showed that he was a newbie, that he's never been a politician. Overall, I think he should be out there a bit more. And of course, Adam Schiff would like nothing more to run against a Republican, given that Dems outnumber Republicans two to one in the states. Well, I think you're exactly right. I mean, it he obviously showed that he's a first-time candidate, and you're going up against three very experienced, very aggressive uh, politicians in Katie Porter and Adam Schiff and Barbara Lee. And that's very tough when you haven't spent a lifetime thinking about these policy uh, issues or even debating. You know, de- debating in and of itself is a hard thing uh, to do and can be for people who aren't familiar with uh, with it. And you can get tripped up before you even know it, as he kind of did, you know, when they kept pressing him, you know, are you going to vote for Donald Trump in this election? Do you agree with all of the provisions of the Republican Party, things like that, where normal voters, well, they don't think this way. And so it's a challenge when you're transitioning from being a regular voter to now you want to be your party standard bearer. I think the ultimate goal in the election is if you're Adam Schiff, you want your general election opponent to be Steve Garvey because that means you're going to be elected United States Senator in November. And so the goal in the debate is you want to bring out that Steve Garvey is a plausible Republican candidate and get all the Republican voters to coalesce behind him. Because if that happens, if Republican voters in California coalesce around Steve Garvey in a low turnout election where Republicans pretty much always vote, Steve Garvey will make the top two. And so I predict, you know, with $35 million in the bank, I predict you're going to see Adam Schiff running faux attack ads against Steve Garvey because... Because what he's trying to do will be to drive up his name ID and send a message to Republican voters that Steve Garvey is an actual Republican and that's who uh, you should be voting for. Now, as far as the Democratic side of things, Adam Schiff did pretty well for himself. I don't think he had any cringe moments or anything that would get him into hot water with uh, the Democratic voters. He's a strong, I would say, front runner. You know, he's ahead of the field by, you know, anywhere from a few points to double digits. You know, so it's really this battle for second. And, you know, if you're uh, a Katie Porter, you want to knock a Garvey out. Uh, And if you're a Barbara Lee, you know, you want to knock all of them out. So I think the challenge for a Katie Porter is you and Barbara Lee are fighting over the same voter pool, number one. And number two, Katie Porter is more known in Southern California. She's not really known in Northern California. California, flip side for Barbara Lee. And um, those who do know Katie Porter in Southern California aren't as enamored with her as you might think. Remember, she narrowly won her last house race despite spending something like 20 or $25 million. So I think unless the progressive far left base coalesces around a Porter or a Lee, I think right now what you're seeing is they're kind of canceling one another out and we've got a, our Sacramento event coming up. Tim, why don't you chat a little bit about that? So uh, for those of you who want to dive into all of the hot issues facing California, housing, homelessness, uh, global warming issues, education, taxes and spending, crime, our California Ideas in Action conference is for you. And uh, our next conference is going to be on February 13th in Sacramento. It's a free event thanks to the generosity of our supporters. If you want to be there, there and have a great lunch and hear from great speakers and learn a lot and be around great like-minded people. Go to pacificresearch.org slash events and register today. We only have a few spots left. We'd love to have you there. It's going to be a great event. And so today's podcast, we have a terrific guest, Roger Simon. He's a famous Hollywood screenwriter, director, columnist, thinker, someone who evolved from kind of a standard Hollywood leftist into a conservative. And he has a terrific new book out called American Refugees, which kind of documents his move from leaving California. 
California to go to Nashville, Tennessee, but it also documents other people like him who decided to leave California because of the politics or for whatever reason and move to Nashville and other places around the country where, you know, they thought they would find a more welcoming home. And you kind of learn about their journey and the up and downs and what they found there. It's a very interesting book. And we have a really terrific discussion with Roger. I think you'll all enjoy it very much. Thanks so much. And here's Roger Simon. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Roger. Thank you for having me. So, yes, we're, we're thrilled to have you to talk about your, your terrific new book, American Refugees, which is available now for purchase at all the major booksellers. So it gives a personal story to something that's been a major focus of PRI's research in, in recent years, namely the, the out-migration of people, employers, jobs from California to other states. So let's start with the discussion on your book with your journey from being a a prominent entertainment industry liberal to a noted Southern California conservative outcast. And why, after all these years, did a great Hollywood screenwriter, journalist, and author like yourself ultimately decide to, to leave the state for Tennessee? Well, it took a while because uh, part of it was due to my political migration that you referred to, uh, which really began almost in the 1990s with the OJ trial, because I had been up until then a reasonably devout semi-left winger uh, of the very conventional Southern California sort uh, in the entertainment industry. And I got disturbed by the obvious bias in the OJ trial, but I didn't know what to make of that, really. Um, But gradually, around 9-11, I I started to switch over altogether. And what what that did was I, I started writing a blog uh, to I had a novel coming out from my Moses Wine Detective Story series, and the publisher, which was a branch of Random House, didn't seem so happy with the book. So I thought, well, I got to to um, promote this myself. And author websites are kind of boring. I saw this blog called the Instapundit, so I said, well, I'll do that. So I I started blogging and I started telling the truth about my political move. And apparently a lot of people were doing the same thing at the same time. Didn't help the book much, but I became a rather prominent blogger. And from that point, we started PJ Media or Pajamas Media at that time to sort of amalgamate this stuff. And for my troubles, lo and behold, I get in my mailbox, which leads up to your question, a message, we know where you live. Squirreled. Uh, It did not make me very happy. Needless to say, but we did not move immediately, although we discussed it endlessly. And then gradually, by it took a long time. By 2018, we finally moved. I, I was voting for Charleston, South Carolina, and my wife and daughter were voting for Nashville, where we live now. Uh, not only was I outnumbered, they were right because uh, one week after we moved, the area of Charleston I wanted to move through was under a couple of feet of water from a hurricane. So we sighed in relief. So here we are in the snow in Nashville today. But the snow is bearable. Hurricanes are in your living room or not. But um, it, it took it, it took a while. And one of the things about writing about it, and it, we've been here five and a half years now, it took me a long time to write about it because I had to live the experience. And moving, I would I can't give an exact numerical analysis, but I, it, I overall I made a and we made a good decision. But there were negatives too. I mean, there were difficulties too. And anybody who thinks that moving is nirvana it, or anything is nirvana is in for a surprise. On the other hand. I think that the people who move and try to improve their lives through it, uh, chances are they will. So in the first chapter of you of your book, you you start with a, a little anecdote of a recent California transplant who, upon meeting her new Tennessee neighbors, informed them, we're from California, but we're not bringing California values with us. And it's certainly something that resonated with me because every time I go visit my dear friends who live in Nashville, I always say the same thing when they introduce uh, me uh, to their friends. Oh. So how were you received by your new neighbors? when you and your family moved to Tennessee a few years back? Well, they, you know, I think it's different from a lot of people because 
I, you know, I'm not wildly publicly known, but I was publicly known. So a lot of people, you know, welcomed me who were on the more conservative side, people who came out of the woodwork who had been reading my work in various ways. And so it made it easier, I think, than it is for most people, simply because I automatically had a few friends. And uh, so I didn't suffer from a lot of the suspiciousness right away. But later you realize that there are certain ingrown things that make people suspicious, even if someone in my in my role. But, uh, you know, speaking of that introduction to the book and, 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 the, and the question you're talking about, that is the heart of something I observed close up. Because there was a lot of suspicion of people for that reason. They were good. They weren't. They were just there for the money. In other words, they were just just moved so they didn't have to pay a ridiculous tax like you do in California. And that was not the full story at all. To make the effort to move is a big effort. To lift, especially if you're a family, it, it, it's something you don't do casually just to say in, Send, save a few thousand dollars in taxes. I don't think. I mean, it's nice to send a few, save a few dollars in taxes. Nobody wants to pay taxes, but it is not the primary no motivation for a lot of people. It is for some companies, but not for individuals and families that much. Most of the people that I talk to, and part of this, I will admit, is is the nature of who I am and who I met, that were largely were primarily driven by ideological reasons, by wanting to return to the country that they believed they grew up in. And to some extent, they found that, and to some extent, they didn't find that, because there are entrenched, entrenched forces in the South, in the, in the so-called red states, uh, sometimes very severe, as in Georgia, sometimes mild, as in Tennessee, that, you know, put you back. <laughs> I mean, the, the red states are under attack, too, by all kinds of liberalism, including the co covert hind that comes in Republican clothes. Roger, you focus on Williamson County, a, a suburb community of Nashville, in profiling some of the California refugees. So paint a picture of this community for our listeners and, and what drew some of the people you profile in your book to, to settle there. Well, that's an interesting, uh, very interesting question, because in Williamson County, if you could imagine um, a nirvana for American conservatives of of, of a upper middle class or middle class to upper class, some, you know, people who are professionals, etc., to move to, it would be on paper and by physical appearance. Williamson County, which is, I'm talking to you right now about 15 minutes drive or less from Williamson County, probably today a little bit more because there's a lot of snow in the room. But normally, it's I'm there all the time because I have friends and we go up for dinner. It's not a big deal. Now, Williamson County, I would describe as, and did in the book, as a kind of Norman Rockwell meets sushi bars, meaning you have the best of both worlds. You would theoretically have this beautiful existence in a beautiful place. It's where a lot of the country music stars live. Marsha Blackburn lives there, people like that. And on the other hand, you have modernity there in terms of, you know, the things that you might get in L.A. Not not maybe as many sushi bars, but as sushi bars, if you know, if you know what I mean. You're, you're, you're not going to be living in a private existence. Now, a lot of people then wanted to move there because all of this life is missing. And one of the, of the things that attracted them a lot is it was reputed to have one of the best public school systems in the country. Now, that turned out to be something of a surprise because there was a lot of woke stuff in that uh, public school system. And then these people arrived, a lot of people I met and described in the book, and they went, whoa, wait a minute, we didn't, we didn't buy into this. And there was a certain amount of fighting going on between them, the newcomers, and the oldsters who were grouped around the Chamber of Commerce that didn't want anybody, didn't want ripples in in their highly profitable existence so you know these are the kinds of things that um, you could never have anticipated from far away i mean it's the world as it really works as opposed to the world you know idealistically and there's nothing really bad in that ultimately because i think right now those same groups are beginning just beginning to mesh together to learn from each other now 
you, the, the old guard had this argument against we newcoming, let's say, super constitutionalist people who would love Vivek Ramaswamy or something like that. We uh, we came with our super ideals. On the other hand, they claimed, well, look, this this part of the world were Southern Democrats until like 15 years ago. We're the ones who changed it. And to an extent, they have an argument, although some of them remain Southern Democrats in Republican clothes. So the whole thing is fascinating, really, and novelistic. I try to treat it. When I write books, I'm more of a novelist than I am a reporter in a way. Not that I lie, I don't do that at all, but I mean, I try to paint a picture that's more of the way a novelist would. And uh, and that's probably more the way that I see the world. I'm not data-driven, and I don't believe that data can tell the full story on something like this. So you characterize the fed-up Californians who are moving to states like Tennessee as a new cavalry of American refugees who, as you write, so preferred to live in a constitutional republic that they were willing to pull up stakes and and trek across the country to live in accordance with their values. So this begs the question that the, the people that you've just been talking about, were they happy with what they found when they moved to Tennessee? Look, they, you, they, they're, they're, there's no way to generalize the whole thing, but they're most of them, the real the rubber meets the road in the fact that, as far as I know, almost all of the people I talk to are still here because there's nothing that could prevent them from m- moving on. So in that sense, they are happy with it. And, and, and indeed, the, certain groups that I ran into were returnees to this, interestingly, to uh, to Williamson County, particularly, I met a whole group of of ex athletes who had traveled the world as professional athletes, and then decided to come back and live in the, in that area. It was kind of interesting. Many of them were very religious people too. So it, it was, you know, I think on balance, yeah, they were, they were the cavalry. I mean, I they riding in on SUVs and not horses like in a John Ford movie. They see themselves to a degree of saving the South from itself, saving the red states, I should say, from itself. I, I don't talk about, because I don't know them well, the red, the areas like Idaho and Montana, and where, where other people are relocating up north. I'm only speaking here of the snowy South today. Uh, not just the South, but the, the states I deal with besides Tennessee or Georgia and Florida and Texas and a little bit of Arizona, uh, that's it. So there are differences between all of them, actually, uh, it, which is interesting. And I and I think the, my book, to some degree, is a consumer book, because if you read it, you get a sense of which where you might fit in uh, one to the other. Uh, the other thing I discovered about people, and I talked to quite a number who were in L.A. and New York, who are old friends of mine, and talked about, well, what's it like there? Should I move to, to Nashville, Franklin, blah, 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 all those questions. And you realize that certain people are, you know, what we used to call driving on the freeway looky loose. They just want to hear about it, but they never want to do it. Whereas other people will jump up and do it very quickly. And it made me think about the whole question of refugee, which is in itself interesting because certain people left places like Poland and Italy and built and Ireland and built this country into what it is, whereas other people stayed behind in those same countries under the same conditions that the other people fled. So it's interesting. There's a personality type that wants to go and move on. And there's another personality. And I'm not making a value judgment here, Ed, because it's what makes you feel good and comfortable in your life you should do. But, you know, I recommend my book as an investigation into that question subtextually, as it were. So to follow up on that, Roger, you also explore in your book, Georgia, Florida, Texas, and some of the other destinations where many California expats often relocate. So why, in your view, was Tennessee a better place to live compared to these other seemingly good spots for former Californians? Like, what are some of the problems with with these states, and especially as you identified it in Georgia? Yeah, I mean, Georgia's got, I think, both high and low. It's got m- more problems in its government. It's it's really it's really a more of a corrupt place. There's corruption everywhere in America. Let's face it. It's, it 
you know, where there's government, there's going to be corruption because the system kind of invites it with a donation to politicians, which is endemic to the way our society works. And it'd be nice if we could fix, fix it, fix it, but I don't think we can immediately. But the, but, but Georgia, you can almost smell it, and we we've seen it in on both sides of the political spectrum. I noticed just today the governor of Georgia refused to investigate the woman who's the attorney in Fulton County that's in trouble. I mean, the, 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 there's a kind of game in that state. And I got to, I was there a lot because I was there for the Epic Times covering the election, the recount, various things, some of which I can't even, I couldn't write about because of uh, threats of lawsuits. I mean, the whole place, the, the, you, I, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I think that uh, Savannah is a beautiful town. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting if you read about it. If you like to drink, I don't like to drink that much, but people who like to drink, it's an interesting place to be because it's got more, you know, bars and hangouts than you can imagine. And it, and it certainly got gorgeous architecture, but it's but Atlanta is like the worst of Los Angeles with no entertainment. <laughs> Besides, and plenty of traffic too, but it's, you know, and also there's a lot of violence in Atlanta. It, there's violence everywhere, as we know. I, I, I think that the Florida is obviously a good place to go, and Texas is a very good place to go. Texas is a gigantic place, as everybody knows, and there are good and bad parts of it, and um, I don't make claims to knowing it all, um, uh, but I think in in certain areas of Texas, San Antonio area and so forth is very good. In other areas around Austin, it's turning into Los Angeles. So you write about the political awakening of some of these refugees that really began when they arrived in their new homes in Tennessee. So what were some of the issues that their newfound activism focused on? Oh, I think most of it, most of it, to begin with, came out of schools because uh, they had they had assumed the educational system would be something other than it wasn't. But that smeared into a lot of other different kinds of uh, things, including uh, electoral integrity. Uh, voting machines are used here in uh, Tennessee, and that's they're not used in Paris. Because in 2008, the French thought there was they were too easily corrupted. And I think the French are right. And, you know, so there was a lot of defensiveness around that and a lot of urging um, by Californians a lot and, and people from Chicago and New York to get rid of voting machines and just have, uh, you know, uh, paper ballots like we did in the deep dark days of this country, but so that was another linchpin area. But those are the two ones that come to mind very quickly. Uh, th and then there were other. Uh, the, oh, the, the other huge issue is healthcare, uh, and in that, you know, you had the um, Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt Medical School and so forth, Vanderbilt Hospital, which dominates healthcare in Tennessee, much the way Harvard Medical does in Massachusetts and. And Duke does in uh, in North Carolina, um, all fulfilling a very pro government, pro pro shot direction. And also another area, of course, was the um, was the gender reassignment area with children, which again uh, Vanderbilt uh, ended up at being in the um, I don't know what role you would call that the progressive role on that on that side of that. So that also became a, an area of disagreement. Act now, when I say that, uh, there were quite a number of locals who agreed with with us news, newcomers on these things. It's, it's not all these guys think that and these guys think that. It's not that at all, and it couldn't possibly be. But you were asking me where where are the areas where the linchpin areas, as it were, the the inciting areas, I just gave you quite a few, really. Then when I, when you started to ask me about it, I go, oh yeah, that one, and that one, <laughs> uh, and and it's ongoing. Roger, in in your book, you make the case that the activism of these California transplants in their new communities should really be viewed in the larger context of the current national political battle for for the heart and soul of this country. So, how so? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> first of all. Uh, 
if the red states go blue, which the which the the left wants more, when you're down here, you see how much they want it. Oh, do they want it? And they're doing it from the big cities out into the country. Uh, and so that battle, this it, you know. That battle recapitulates everything. I mean, it's essentially the same battle that's going on in California today because California is not entirely a blue state. It's just it's a blue state by population, but by probably physically, there are more. In fact, I, I had a conversation with Victor Davis Hanson about this book, and we, we agreed because he knows California as well as anybody that, you know, the the two thirds of the land to the you know, to the east side of California is all red, but the population base on the uh, on the coast is blue, blue, blue. And you know, you see that recapitulated everywhere. It's recapitulated in Tennessee, te- Texas, almost every state. Um, that Miami went it went for um, DeSantis is, is something of an anomaly. It's the only blue city, semi blue city that there is. I mean. You, you go all over the country and you start to look at where you're at, where's the blue city? You find, it's hard to find one. Here in Tennessee, Nashville, Memphis, and Knoxville are all, and Chattanooga, are all, are all blue. Whereas the state went two thirds for Trump, so figure it out. It's pretty, so that, that you know, that's a, exactly the national battle. So throughout the book, you share your experiences discussing politics with a, a prominent Tennessee political insider who you call Rocky Top. So share with our listeners a little bit about, you know, kind of who Rocky Top is and uh-huh. some of the most important lessons you've learned from him as you attempt to make sense of the political world in, in your new state. Well, you know, well, actually, Rocky Top called himself Rocky Top. It's a famous uh, uh, country, song, country song, bluegrass country song from about 30 years ago, but it's now the national, the state song of Tennessee. So he, this guy who, um, I, I saw, he saw my political Don Juan character in a way in the book and in life. I, he's a very humorous fellow, but he, he spent many years in Washington, D.C. and many years in Tennessee. In Washington, D.C., I can't say too much because he wants to remain anonymous I guess so that his old friends don't uh, beat him up or something or excommunicate him for life. But uh, he he was the advisor to the president, and he was also the advisor to uh, governors of Tennessee, not the current one, but others. And so I used him. He he he. You know, he what he does is when when you talk to him. You see the perspective of someone who is deeply idealistic at the same time as acknowledges the reality of how politics works in the United States, whether it's in Tennessee, Maine, or wherever you name it, or certainly Washington, D.C. So uh, that's uh, what to say specifically what I learned from that is hard because I don't know what I specifically learned. It's it's what I learned emotionally. Uh, maybe it's a form of tolerance, which is an interesting thing to say. But for example, when I first went to his house, which is in a rural area about 45 minutes drive from Nashville in one direction or another, I will say, but very beautiful country the way it all is here outside the city. And <clears throat> when I got to his house, which was a, on a beautiful piece of land, but fairly um, modest, but it had outbuildings like many places do here in, in the rural areas. And there was one right by his house, maybe exactly where I parked my car, actually. And he told me this was the old slave headquarters, a uh, slave house. And I went, whoa. <laughs> uh, you know, I said, I feel, how could this guy avoid property that actually had an old slave house in it? But then he explained that his family was abolitionists. They were from the area completely. And what happened when a a black lawyer friend of his came up from Chattanooga? And the black lawyer friend came up with his son. And the and the son was thirteen or something like that. And and he and and the son started wandering into the house, to, into the slave house, or like more like a shed, just by accident because of the thought that he was talking to the father. You know, the, what a kid does is wandering around. And, and and my friend Rocky Top said, "Well, we men shouldn't get him." Let him go in there, and then the, the 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 black lawyer said, "No, let's let him get him. Tell him what it is." And he told him what it was. 
And the kid came out and both father and son said, this is great. We're learning the past is gone. And that's kind of what I learned from Rocky Top. You've got to let go of these things. And well, <laughs> it's heavy, but it's a big message. And I, I, you know, it's the same thing that Morgan Freeman said when he was on 60 Minutes, how do you end racism? You don't talk about it. As you document your firsthand look at local political battles in Tennessee, I think many of our California listeners would be surprised to hear that your firsthand tales of these political battles where the establishment really carries a day on on policy and and politics, rather than the conservative insurgency we're, we're seeing elsewhere. So what do you think explains this? even in deep red states like Tennessee? Money. <laughs> you know, the famous quote from H.L. Mencken, when, when somebody says it's not about the money, it's about the money. These are, these, these are mostly established business relations here. They think, if things upset that, then they don't want them. It's not, it's, it, the politics are in second division. And I think that's what slows it down a lot. I mean, the people come in and they go, oh, except that in the in the big cities, in, in the middle of the cities, they're so blue that accommodation is made for those people. But mostly it's the money thing. Uh, now, when I say blue, it, it, Nashville is not blue like Los Angeles. That's that's a mistake. <laughs> it's it's a kind of purple blue that's different. I mean, it's not you know you don't or, or San Francisco you don't get these wacky things going on. Then you, you don't find them uh, you know voting for stuff that's like from Mars or you might might be voted for in the uh, in the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party. You don't find that, but you do find odd decisions and, and objections. So yeah, everything has to be looked at from. Uh, 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 the point of view of sophistication to some degree. Um, but, you know, the, I'm surprised you you haven't asked me about what the part of my book that people find, a lot of people have found the most interesting. Uh, so I'm going to jump in and talk about it. Uh, it made me, moving here made me more religious. And I'll, if you'd like to explain, I'll explain it. Please. Well, there's a chapter toward the end called Steeples. Now, if you live in Los Angeles all your life, as I did virtually, and before that, New York, uh, you live a largely secular life. You know, like Los Angeles has big churches and synagogues, but <laughs> uh, they don't dominate the city at all. I mean, you know, Warner Brothers dominates the city. Universal, <laughs> those kinds of things dominate the city. Uh, even the Getty Museum, but not, you know, think about the, some people, but very, most people just drive by it. And, oh, yeah. Or they go to church once in a while, or they go to synagogue on the high holly. And that's it. That covers the, covers the neighborhood for most people. Certainly did for me. Uh, when I got here, I drove around in the, I kept saying, what are all these steeples doing in this place? Everywhere everywhere you go around here, there's steeples on every corner, and people are going to church, everybody. And the Jews were going to synagogue. And I, I went, hmm. <laughs> and uh, if, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, about three weeks after I, I got here, I quickly joined a club because I, I love to play tennis, and I, and I go to the gym. And those are things where you really meet people. And I actually met someone at the gym that I had met at another political meeting because he was a fundraiser for some Republican candidate. And he was very friendly, he came up to me and said, welcome to Nashville, how are you liking it so far? But, and, you know, one of the things about moving to the South is people are much friendlier. You almost think it's a trick at the beginning. Anyway, so this guy was very friendly, and he said, uh, you know, what church are you join, joining? So I said, well, uh, well I'm Jewish. And he, 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 said, he didn't do quite a double take. He just did a double beat. To, oh, and then he said, well, which synagogue are you joining? And, you know, it took me several years before I got involved in the synagogue, but I did. And now I'm probably paying more attention to my faith as a Jew than I ever did in the cities of New York and Los Angeles that have, have more Jews than anywhere but Israel. So it's it's it, it has an impact. And, and, and most of the people that I know and our friends are evangelical Christians. And uh, the ones I play tennis with, I play in regular tennis games because I'm a tennis fanatic. Um, they are largely a couple of Jewish guys, but mostly evangelical Christians. Uh, who, interestingly, all love Israel. It's 
It's interesting that your experience kind of mirrors mine when I go and, and visit my friends back there. And some of the, I think, the best parts of the trip, always on a Sunday, I always joke, it's time for Protestant fellowship, quote unquote. And you go to the churches, it's literally on every street corner, you're exactly right. And the people couldn't be more friendly, more welcoming. And the kind of stereotype image you might have of going to such a service, it's nothing like that at all. That's right. It's really quite a wonderful thing. I've gone to, uh, I've been taking to services that are not Jewish, they're from various Protestant churches here. And I'm always, always impressed, always feel good, and always welcome. So, I mean, that alone is a good reason to move. So, Roger, as we close, you know, looking back on your journey and the journey of some of the folks you profile in your book, what hope do you think states like Tennessee and the, you know, that this new spirit and new activism we're seeing there brings to the the kind of changes that conservatives and free marketeers and, you know, people on our side of, of things want to see being made nationally? Well, um, you know, what Comrade Stalin once said, first you're going to have socialism in one country. That's where he disagreed with Trotsky. And, you know, and I think that working to make a state good is going to have natural positive ramifications on the federal government. Um, now, you know, we're standing before a really dramatic election now, so there's a lot of that in the air. And I, I was uh, in Des Moines just the other day, um, Broad, I was doing the broadcasting from Vivek Ramaswamy's uh, headquarters the night he stepped down and endorsed Trump. It was quite dramatic. I, I know Vivek fairly well, and I was proud of him, frankly. And it was a very hopeful movement moment. And I think that what's going on in, in many of these states is hopeful. When I'm negative about Georgia, me, I met many people in Georgia who were terrific. And I hope if they're listening to this show, I hope they know I know that because the, the, almost always the problem is not with the rank and file. The problem is with leadership. And if the rank and file it asserts itself into a degree, what I've seen is that they are. The more they do that, the more hopeful it will become. Finally, Roger, we, we call our podcast Next Round because of PRI's proximity to, to wine country and our love of discussing politics and policy over a great glass of California wine. So I know you don't drink much, but if you had to make a recommendation or even a non-alcoholic drink, uh, what wine, beer, cocktail, or, or other beverage uh, you're enjoying these days to, to celebrate the publication of your new book? Uh, well, first of all, before, and when I say I don't drink as much as I used to, I used to spend a lot of time in Napa Valley and uh, Sonoma Valley, and I've been in a lot of those vineyards, and they're great they're, they're for any wine drinking. I mean, they're as good as anything in the world. Uh, but nowadays, I'm drinking uh, Tennessee whiskey and Kentucky whiskey <laughs> a little bit more, and um, when I... Um, Salute something. My drink of choice is almost always an old fashioned uh, with a wood for reserve, usually. Thank you so much. I like uh, Angel's Envy. Um, Angel's Envy is very Yeah, good. nice and smooth. A, a Kentucky bourbon. Yeah, and Leaper's Fork is good. We're about 15 minutes from right where we are. Oh, Roger, thank you so much. Thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.